Bonsoir à tous. Uh, good evening. My name is Bertrand Bechwalter and I'm the, the director of the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni. We are together with the team, together with uh, Isabelle, uh, Angela and, um, and, and all the team. We are very happy to uh, host you and to welcome you tonight for this uh, fifth edition of our cycle Art Matters, uh, which is a series of uh, discussion on, uh, on art uh, that we have launched uh, a year ago uh, and that uh, where we uh, invite uh, artists and curators to discuss their works and the way they uh, resonate with uh, the world we live in. We had the pleasure, uh, as part of the cycle, to uh, welcome and to invite uh, artists and curators, uh, Mathieu Cleyer Babonin, Isabelle Cornaro. We had also a great uh, conversation between Zineb Sedira and uh, Sonia Boyce, uh, who will uh, soon and were probably already are on their way to Venice uh, and uh, quite busy with, uh, with the, 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 the installation, the, the, the Venice Biennial. Uh, we had also had the pleasure to, uh, to host cooking sections and Anna Collin uh, and uh, uh, recently Clara Schulman. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, among us um, Anne Dressen, a curator at the Musée d'Art uh, Moderne de Paris, uh, the artist uh, Natsuko Uchino and Aaron Angel, and uh, writer and editor Amy uh, Sherlock. Uh, dear Amy, Anne, uh, Natsuko and Aaron, thank you very much for accepting our, our invitation. Um, and uh, as you know, arts, uh, craft and fine arts have always maintained a, a quite close relationship. Um, if artisanal activities have been marginalized sometimes in the, in the cultural discourse, um, some artists, modern and, and contemporary, have embraced uh, crafts to convey political and social uh, messages. And this uh, very special relationship was uh, recently explored and, uh, and presented in the critically uh, acclaimed exhibition called The Flames, curated by André Sen at the Musée d'Art Moderne de Paris. Uh, and we, have, uh, we are delighted to have alongside Anne uh, Dressen uh, Natsuko, uh, who is based in Belzeve, in the south of, uh, of France, and, uh, and Aaron, who is based in, uh, in London, and uh, who's uh, practiced Aaron and, and uh, Natsuko and researched question uh, and challenge the traditions of, uh, of ceramic. Um, the conversation will be tonight will be laid, led by uh, London-based writer and editor Amy uh, Sherlock. Amy uh, Sherlock was the deputy director, editor sorry, of the International Arts and Culture ju uh, Journal Freeze from 2011 to 2022, and uh, curator of the annual Freeze Academy Art and Architecture uh, Conference. And she, know, she now works as a features editor at Word of uh, Inter magazine. Amy, Anne, Aaron, and Tsuko, welcome again. Uh, and I, uh, I will, uh, I'm leaving you uh, the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you, can you all hear me? Is that, is that good? Great. Um, well, thank you to the Institut Francais. I'm sorry not to be doing this conversation in French, but I think that mine is too, too dusty for such an occasion. Um, I was very pleased to be asked to moderate this conversation because the I have basically feel like I've been having a version of this conversation about the relationship between art and ceramics and ceramics as art or ceramics as craft and what those two di distinct things mean um, for basically my whole writing career. Um, when I started, at, I was deputy editor at Free Years magazine for um, a decade and when I started there I was looking at a lot of work in the kind of genre that the great uh, scholar and critic of craft Glenn Adamson would describe as sloppy craft which is to say artists often young using materials with a very long history and craft tradition and technique in ways that were unconventional um, and perhaps even uh, to some eyes, slightly dismissive of those histories. So, at the same time, you know, in kind of parallel with that, since 2012 or 13, when I was starting out, we've seen the really the absorption of um, makers who at one time would probably have been called potters, absorbed into the spaces and the discourses and also the markets of the quote-unquote mainstream contemporary art world. Um, I'm thinking there of people like Magdalene Dundo, the um, Kenyan British potter who's got work in the upcoming Venice Biennale, or Edmund Duval, trained a, a long apprenticeship as a ceramicist, but who's 
2013 exhibition at Gagosian Gallery in New York was really a kind of watershed moment, I think, in that particularly that market absorption of ceramic production. Um, and at the same time, I feel like since in the decades since then, um, the conversation has moved on uh, in terms of this kind of dismantling this art craft hierarchy. And I think now there are much more interesting conversations being had uh, uh, in artistic circles and by artists about the way that ceramic functions um, in the context of broader conversations about pressing issues, e ecological questions or questions of uh, identity or community. Um, so I am very excited to, to be on stage with you three who are all coming at these questions from slightly different angles. I think to begin, just because I didn't, we didn't know, you know, what the audience, who the, would be in the audience or how much you would know about um, Anne Natsuko and, and Aaron's respective practices, they're just going to do a, a brief presentation um, and then we will open the conversation from there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm super happy to uh, actually uh, get back uh, and uh, and uh, speak about that show that just uh, closed. Uh, that was uh, open for four months, which was a slightly too short time, I think. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was uh, an adventure. Um, that's uh, I was super happy to be working with um, and with Natsuko uh, Ushino who worked uh, at different uh, levels uh, on that exhibition, but we're going to speak about it uh, um, broader later. So the, the show uh, was a kind of a third chapter of a trilogy that uh, I curated at the Musée uh, d'Art Moderne, um, which uh, started with a textile exhibition uh, called Decorum in uh, 2013. Uh, followed by another one called uh, Medusa, uh, Jewelry and Taboos uh, in the 2017. And then, uh, so The Flames, The Age of uh, Ceramics, that ended up this uh, trilogy, which was uh, inspired as the two other ones by uh, contemporary artists interested in those um, mediums and uh, craft and who really, I think, um, inspire or really kind of guide us to uh, look differently to those uh, practices. Um, those three shows had in common to be uh, trans-historical, so they were not only contemporary uh, art involved, but really a dialogue um, that I uh, seek to actually um, yeah, uh, approach those mediums in a, in a sort of a new way or at least a challenging uh, expectations about those, um, those, uh, those mediums and practices. Um, so what I... Uh, I I'm showing uh, this image of uh, Claire Tommy, uh, who is well known, I think, in the UK, or at least um, uh, I think so. <laughs> and she, uh, it was a very uh, impressive uh, installation that kind of welcomed the, um, the visitors. You have to imagine you're climbing a stair and there is this huge uh, amount of uh, broken uh, vessel. <coughs> That was a bit, it's so it's, a, it's called monument, but it's uh, obviously an untimely mon monument. And it was a way to uh, kind of uh, openly uh, address the fact that the show is going to um, approach the ceramics in a sort of a deconstruct deconstructed uh, way. And uh, it was also a piece that I thought interesting in the terms of uh, it addresses kind of techniques, but also uses and messages. So it was, and th those three kind of uh, themes were uh, the sections, thematical sections that I um, chose for that uh, exhibition. Uh, so it was a trans-historical, uh, not chronological. It was never my uh, aim to uh, try to, 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 to kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, think of uh, of ceramics in a in a historical uh, way, but more to yeah to have uh, confrontations, dialogues, 
sometimes uh, contrasts uh, underlined, but the, the most ancient piece uh, was actually uh, related to that uh, Venus from uh, minus 29,000 uh, BC, and uh, which is uh, the oldest ceramics uh, we know of, uh, at least uh, today. And an example of a very young uh, artist called Morgan Courtois, a stoneware um, piece. It was also a dialogue between uh, utilitarian uh, pieces, uh, sculptural ones, serial, unique, signed, anonymous, mat um, materialistic, or very conceptual uh, pieces. And uh, a lot of the pieces were actually uh, both, or, you know, it was never like one or the other, but actually it's uh, often actually beyond any uh, binaries. Uh, um, dimensions. So I was also really happy to have the one of the Mo Fontaine uh, by Marcel Duchamp, which is obviously a, a porcelain um, uh, sculpture. <laughs> I also had uh, some kind of, I call them like intuitions, and uh, for instance, I I was not able to get the uh, Meret Oppenheim uh, very famous uh, déjeuner uh, en fourrure, that's uh, not leaving the MoMA anymore, but I had a souvenir of it that she made uh, later on. And uh, so it's actually a, a sort of a frame uh, drawing, but covered with, uh, with fur. But I, um, I started to think that she might have, and I have no clue if it's true or not, it's more like, a, as I said, an intuition, that maybe the, the, the fact that there is this very famous Chinese glaze called uh, the, the haze um, fur was, had maybe had an influence on her uh, piece on this. Uh, and I started to ask a few uh, specialists of Meret Oppenheim, and they were actually interested in that um, uh, proposition. I also um, sort of dared uh, putting a very short uh, excerpt of the ghost uh, in famous uh, movie because I learned through American friends that actually that movie had an impact on the popularity of, uh, of ceramic practices in an amateur way. And it was close by uh, Auguste Rodin, a um, uh, very impressive uh, Torso uh, by Adele. I also <coughs> was um, extremely interested in um, kind of uh, showing uh, less uh, famous uh, figures, as uh, Marie Talbot, who was uh, from the 80s, uh, 90s, uh, 80s, 50s, sorry, um, one of the first or uh, only woman uh, in the um, center of France, a very famous uh, village called Potter's uh, village called La Borne. And she uh, actually did those fountains that I thought were extremely bold uh, for, the, for the time. And that from the same period, uh, this um, Potter called uh, Dave uh, Drake, uh, who was a slave uh, in, uh, in South Carolina in the US, uh, who also signed his, uh, his pottery uh, that he was making for the master uh, who enslaved uh, him. And uh, I actually heard about Dave through um, through Seaster Gates, who did a really like a deep uh, research uh, and uh, and an exhibition on on him. I also established a feminist uh, kind of uh, genealogy, and um, I I was lucky to actually being able to uh, exhibit five of the um, plates by Vanessa Bell and uh, Duncan Grant that are actually uh, owned uh, and, uh, and um, displayed in the Charleston house. They, you know, they were part of the Omega Workshop um, group. And, it's, uh, and I, put, I put them in relationship to uh, some test plates that Judy Chicago made, and a medallion in uh, stoneware that those, this uh, couple called uh, Laura made also in Bourges. So it's different 
places, different uh, years, like 20 years difference uh, of each. So it's a pure coincidence, but it's uh, interesting to actually um, link them because they are both like, uh, they are th the three of them are in ceramics and kind of paying homage to a um, forgotten uh, woman in the official history. Um, also, in the last part of the message uh, section, there was a, a piece by Grayson Perry and uh, a few younger artists uh, who define them as, uh, themselves as uh, queer. And um, I just, uh, I was uh, sort of interested by this quote uh, that Grayson Perry um, had. And he said it was actually more difficult to get accepted uh, in the art world as a potter than it was uh, to be a transvestite. And I thought it was a kind of a, a, a strong uh, statement. But I wonder if uh, France is not even like uh, more uh, uh, kind of reluctant uh, on the both uh <laughs> on both sides, and uh, probably a bit different than uh, than in the UK. Um, or a bit less uh, open-minded. Uh, um, and I think it's time to uh, actually uh, pass the, the mic to, uh, to Natsuko, because it's true that we had uh, great <coughs> conversations on um, how uh, interesting and, uh, and um, strongly influential the popular arts were on uh, many uh, modern artists. And uh, we we had a, a few uh, uh, examples in the exhibition, actually. So, I, yeah, I was very happy to uh, work on this exhibition alongside Anne as a sort of art consultant on different topics. M my my main mission was more on display and set design, um, but that also we worked uh, with an uh, architecture agency, of course. So me, I was... Um, part of the team and you know very lucky to be in that discussion um, so I will take uh, over the slideshow and so this is uh, also in the same kind of intuitive um, um, gathering of different elements and um, the 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 way we approach this exhibition and what to me seems uh, a a very radical moment in the uh, museum landscape of France. So that's really the context of a very kind of organized and with with hierarchies of high and low art, basically, and um, uh, the relationships to to craft and and popular culture uh, or traditions or even authorship is. Um, extremely strong like the way the the all of that is organized so um one of the radical moments i think was to um, show on a horizontal level different types of objects that are so here you see on top is a lucio fontana plate um and then just above uh, just underneath they were displayed all in all in one wall display um then you see this is a uh, strainer for uh, making cheese. So it's a rural kind of uh, agricultural functional object. And then and then there's a, a, a minge plate. Um, so that's um, traditional craft from Japan. And obviously I'm from Japan. Um, and But it's a huge influence. The minge movement is a sort of equivalent of the arts and craft movement, but sort of a little bit later in Japan. And um, we can talk about this with Aaron later, but it's a huge influence for ceramicists, both uh, and the renewal of ceramics in the second part of the 20th century, like both for like uh, California and Volkes and, UK, and the UK, UK yeah. obviously with yeah. Bernard Leach. And um, so for us, bringing all of those, the um, uh, Eastern influence, uh, putting functional object and art, uh, modern, m modernist, you know, uh, artwork together seemed like uh, a way to um, sort of reconcile uh, these different uh, oppositions. And this is a window display that I re 
built. Um, so it's um, based on uh, a vitrine that was made by Georges Henri Rivière for the Museum of uh, Art Tradition Populaire. So this is a, a museum that um, um, also triggered the um, constitution of Eco Musée in France, and but it was a research center with all these uh, large vitrines that are sometimes the size of this room, or at least half of this room, and basically they uh, reconstitute the working studio and environment of different uh, types of work, um, and they can be agricultural work, craft-based work. Um, they can be for like making shoes, making cheese. Um, there's also vitrines for music, for these different kind of uh, active cultural activities. And there's one for pottery, and um, it's very large. Um, and so um, it just we couldn't rebuild it uh, in the same way by lack of space and budget, and um, and so we we uh, remade the, the, win the vitrine, trying to follow his um, uh, style. And so he was called the magician of vitrines because a lot of the times, all these um, tools and different objects were in suspension as if just stopped in time. Um, and so that history, you know, it's, it's a longer conversation, but basically there all of these vitrines were made to, for conservation. Uh, purposes to cr to preserve uh, knowledge and um, uh, artifacts of of uh, of uh, gestures and types of work that were to become obsolete and now they actually are and um, but then this museum was closed and then they um, so the the collection of objects which is really gigantic is now in Marseille at Museum. Um, but so in conversation with Marie-Charlotte Calafa, who uh, works at Museum, following uh, the history of the museum, um, we, we made this vitrine and actually the, the reason why it looks like this is also because we reused an existing vitrine of the previous show. Because that's also one of the things that we tried to do in the exhibition display is to recycle um, some of the pedestals that are around in, the, in previous shows and try to use as much as possible the architectural um, kind of um, parcours that was already there in the previous exhibition. Um, voila. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is at the sort of beginning of the show to um, visualize the process of making a pot. Clay to pot. And yeah. yeah, and the bucket is, is clay. We'll, we'll get there. And um, so yeah, there is also a section on uh, the material of the clay material and, and how it relates to a certain type of lifestyle and uh, commitment on um, ecology, even if uh, you know firing can be, uh, uh, of course, high energy uh, consumptive. Um, and this is a picture of a porcelain substrate that will that is used in um, oceans to uh, rec to uh, restore restore coral environments. Mm -hmm. So um, it uses the material quality of porcelain and um, to then uh, restore the ecology. Yeah, the coral kind of grows again thanks to the to the as like the porcelain uh, greff. I don't know how to say greff like the pro as a prosthesis. Transplants, exactly. And because porcelain is uh, obviously out of uh, clay, which is uh, biocompatible, it's like for us, we can use uh, prosthesis uh, out of uh, porcelain. And it's the same with, um, with actually the coral. So it's a very good news. And um, yeah, and it comes from the, it's a uh, earth material and then it, it, it can interact also with the, with the environment. Um, so that was one example. This is a few uh, shots of the display. So um, on the 
left is an install that I made. And then on the right, you see a kind of larger vitrine. And it's, the pictures are very small, but in each vitrine, there's actually uh, objects, but also paintings. Like one of the vitrines that I really adore is there is a Morandi painting. And then you see uh, a tea set in front. And the benches are made by this artist, Le, uh, Leticia Badosman. Um, and yeah, Vio, uh, Violet Patras uh, was the architect of the um, scenography, the general architect. And um, so here, this is a shot of the um, sculptural section. And this comes at the end of the second section, which is about usage. And um, so the first thing is that sculp sculpture and art is um, presented here as another function. And, and it does serve a social function. And so in a way, it comes after the tea cups and the plates and then you know ceramics as sculpture is yet another function and um, this goes back to what I was trying to tell you earlier about the horizontality of um, our of the kind of curatorial parti pris um, and then yeah that's a little bit of a view of the kind of um, display that we've worked with and so you see the pedestal, some of them are painted. It's not uh, systematic, um, but it's also, you know, helps divide in a pedagogical way the different sections of the exhibition. And it's um, sort of inspired by the color of the flame and how it changes be uh, in reaction to um, oxygen. And um, on the right, there's um, the, the wallpaper is by uh, Camille Chamovis. And so, it's also about you know what's in the front and what's what's holding what and creating these kind of um, visual uh, um, like different layers basically. Sure, and a way to also revisit or um, question the white cube uh, convention. That's only one of the options, I guess. And um, we organized a kind of uh, pedagogical section inside the exhibition space, which is all, it seemed like if we were going to put an accent on how ceramics is ubiquitous and um, sort of a calls on our sense of touch and the, the haptic, um, that, um, and also because the museum is this public cultural space that has a public program. Um, with children, with school groups, with different types of groups to sort of have an activity uh, uh, and experience um, through workshops, the content of the exhibition. We thought it was, um, it made sense for the, for the medium that that uh, workshop area was in integrated in the exhibition display. And in, in the technique section, yeah. that was the first, uh, it was not an anti-chamber or something that we kind of used as an introduction. It was really in the heart of the of the exhibition, which was a bit of uh, unusual for us, at least. Uh, usually, all the all the workshops and everything are really like in the basement, like no one really sees what's happening. And in that case, it was uh, really thought of uh, being uh, sort of central and seen uh, in the process of being you know, made and manipulated. And, and then there's another vitrine here um, that's also recycled uh, <laughs> from a previous exhibition. And this is the participatory vitrine where, um, in fact, uh, uh, people uh, that view the show can come and uh, um, contribute a piece. And so it was empty at the beginning, and then it was quite full by the end. Um, and actually, all the things that were brought are very diverse and super interesting, you know, different styles. And so this, again, was to uh, make it more accessible, make it participatory. But, uh, but because it seemed like um, ceramics as a medium is uh, part of our lives and has been part of our life as civilizations for, you know, uh, as long as time. and. Um, and that idea of um, sort of breaking the barriers between the museum and life and between you know craft and art, those hierarchies making it more accessible, that was one of the kind of initiative 
um, that for us helped helped that um, be more visible. And then there's a last little section, which is this uh, a portable version of the exhibition. And so it's a mallette pédagogique, um, highly inspired, obviously, by Marcel Duchamp again. And so there, it's a kind of uh, pedagogical set uh, for the public's uh, department of the museum. And they can take it to these different places. Um, you know, they can be hospitals, prisons, um, where you know people can't uh, um, come to the museum. So then the the exhibition, on a you know of course totally s scaled version, um, can you know go go to the public. And so there are um, objects that you can touch, and there are different you know uh, techniques and different uh, types of clay, different uses. And um, there's a card set that goes with it. So it's a sort of way for the exhibition to live on past the walls of the museum and past the time of the exhibition. And voila, I'm going to go very fast because I know we don't have a lot of time. But I just wanted to open it up onto uh, the kind of things that I'm working with now and my larger practice. I'm not going to get so much into my art practice personally, but more my teaching practice. And so this is a kind of experimentation that we did in this place called Les Grands Ateliers between um, Lyon and uh, Grenoble. And they're a kind of uh, center for working with um, earth construction. So this is unfired earth, um, mineral earth. So, um, and here you see different tests of um, how, mu how much you can shape the clay depending on how much water uh, is in the clay. W or, uh, I mean, it's not pure clay. There's sand and silt in it. But uh, the relationship to water and air is sort of what I, um, see uh, in, in the material and how it lives and how it's sensitive to, um, to, the, to the environment. And very experimental, so you, because every time, you know, the clay composition, the earth composition is gonna be different depending on the site, depending on which uh, horizon you get it from. And so you, it's, you can't really, uh, have one recipe. It's always going to be a kind of testing thing. And uh, yeah, and these kind of different aggregates. And I've been making, you know, Adobe works, but I think also like opening up to craft, it seems interesting, and opening up to vernacular, it seems interesting to open up also to different types of construction tradition and also to architecture. Voila. <laughs> Then, uh, yeah, uh, I think right. it's after, yeah, right. But I can do it for you. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, thanks for that. That looks like a really ambitious exhibition, <laughs> which I didn't get to visit. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for showing us that. It was um, it. Yeah. I can't remember what slides I've got in here, so I'm just going to respond to things <laughs> as I see them. Um, this is my pottery, uh, which is in Hoxton in London. Um, I started this in late 2013 or 2014, uh, just down the road in Haggerston. And it basically, I was at a point in, with my work at the time where I needed uh, a pottery. And so I started one. Um, I'd been working with clay for maybe two years prior to that in a, in a kind of peripatetic sort of manner, like going and borrowing space at other people's studios and learning from books, but not really having like a laboratory environment to, to work on stuff properly um, and to store stuff and to work on things that might take six months before I, they were okay to fire, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think I, I'd started to realize that working with ceramics and working with sculpture and in, in ceramic was sort of where my practice was going, at least for the kind of uh, the kind of backbone of it. Um, I've always worked with lots of other things. I still do work with lots of other things, but ceramics is the kind of the thing I know about, the thing I can kind of teach other people about. Um, so yeah, I needed this kind of uh, lab, and the way to do that. Um, 
turned out to be to kind of run it for other people. So this has always been um, funded by the Arts Council and a host of other kind of donors and, and, and patrons over the years. Um, and I've always run it as a residency program for, for other artists with, with kind of various degrees of intensity. Like at the beginning, I was working with maybe five artists at a time, um, which was crazy, but, but kind of led to things that don't happen now, just as there are things that happen now when we're only working with kind of one or two artists a year, which would didn't happen then. So there's kind of benefits to both, and, and we've always been flexible enough to kind of jump in between those two kind of methods. Um, and we've hosted about 90 artists in residence in, in seven years. Um, which is a lot, yeah, I mean, like, so it, the, it was a lot to begin with. There was like 14 a year for the first two years. Um, what do the artists do? What, do what, it, what is the proposition? The proposition has changed slightly. Uh, it, so I started it as a place that was not interested in working as a pottery. It wasn't interested in making pots. Um, and there's like... People say that I banned vessels, which is sort of true, but it was more that I banned potters, <laughs> which means that we didn't really get many vessels. Like, if we did get them, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't thrown away, but they tended kind of not to. Um, and it was kind of looking at the idea of like, okay, what happens if you start a pottery, which is just for sculpture, which is for artists who haven't necessarily worked with the material before, but want to see what kind of... Um, what ceramics can kind of do for them, not what they can do for ceramics, kind of thing. And like, in every pottery is a unique environment for making ceramic work. You can only do so much within the scale of kind of one pottery. It depends on your kilns, depends on where you are geographically, what kind of clays you can even get sent to your facility. Um, it depends on how much money you have to run firings and things like that. So, it, so it's about what this environment can kind of do, do for artists. Um, yeah, so we hosted mainly um, many kind of painters, sculptors, people who hadn't worked with clay before, filmmakers, people like that. Um, yeah, and then slowly, in a very backwards kind of way, we've become a real pottery, um, which has been quite a fun way to do it. Like picking up lots of bad habits along the way, but also in this kind of slightly untrained, idiosyncratic way, kind of jumping to conclusions, which have actually been quite helpful. Um, you know, not having to learn everything by rote or pretend like we needed a standard wear ever, which actually we yeah. ironically might now be starting a standard wear. But it, it's, it's been fun kind of doing it backwards because I've often worked in, in pottery environments which were part of this kind of older, more kind of parochial system, and then sculpture within that was always seen as a kind of um, aberration. Um, but, I mean, that sounds too harsh, but it, it, it was treated as excessive. Um, and the, the, the world of pottery has a big kind of problem with art just as the world of art has a really big problem with ceramics, um, it doesn't know how to use it properly. Like, uh, the art world, I guess, generally speaking, has quite a high taste level, which completely collapses when they start looking at ceramics. No, no, they, they just don't... You mean they don't, they lack the criteria yeah, to assess it Yeah, they totally, totally lack the Do criteria. Would you share um, that opinion? Or have, I think it's getting better, I should okay. say. But, but I think that's why we had the technical section at the beginning of the uh, expo for Le Flamme, because it is quite technical. I it mean, it has to do with alchemy. It's not, so. I don't even care that people don't know about the technicalities of it. I think that I don't know about the technicality of painting. It, it, I can still differentiate between a really bad picture, I think, I hope I can, and, 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 a, good, and a good painting. The art world's always had a problem with ceramics. It, it's, it's like both dazzled by it and also... Um, made really stupid by it, um, like a lot of the time, I think. Whereas the ceramic world, like, uh, it, it, you have these kind of great ceramics galleries that will occasionally kind of um, veer into showing paintings or, or prints and things like that. And like, without exception, it's, it's always terrible. really <laughs> terrible. Um, I'm thinking of like, like Goldmark, great ceramics gallery in, 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 in Rutland. 
<laughs> in, in the regions of England, um, shows some of the best potters uh, living, and then their art shows are just horrible. It's, 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 uh, I find it so odd, like, the, 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 there's, a, there's no transference between the kind of aesthetic sophistication um, of, of people that... Can I kind of pause things. you there and open the conversation? Because it feels like this is... I've also got one eye on the time, but it feels like this is a kind of um, a good yeah. point in which to... Shall I rush through, like, five other, five other slides? Yeah, Like, sure. I mean rush. Like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sh show us. So, yeah, this is my pottery. This is the, another view of the pottery. Um, these are just nice pictures of my studio, really. I don't have much, much more to say about them. Yeah, it does still look like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I didn't dress it up. <laughs> like, uh, here's a sculpture that I made. Um, this is fired in Hoxton. Um, we fire with gas reduction. We're kind of one of the last places left doing that in the, in the country. Um, and especially for artists, um, one of the only places artists can work with with reduction fired glazes. Uh, another one. Another one. This is anagamma, so this is is uh, unglazed. Um, it's glazed by the kiln itself. So this is a long, long form kind of wood firing process. Um, this is a three day firing, but they can go for three weeks. Um, to a high temperature where the pieces are glazed atmospherically by um, the chemistry that's happening within the fuel wood itself. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, here's another one. Um, oh, good. Okay. I'm going to leave this up. It's a very nice one on which to finish. No, but I just I wanted to stop there because I think there's something very interesting in the point that you were making about a certain mutual illegibility b between the kind of world of ceramics proper and art world proper. Um, and also I think that sometimes in our rush to kind of collapse distinctions, actually, I, I was having a long conversation with a ceramist, a Norwegian, a, a relatively high profile Norwegian ceramicist, um, who I'm writing a catalog text for the other week, and she was laughing because she was like, always you people come from the art world and you assume that the highest aesthetic criteria that a ceramicist can want is to be exhibited in a white cube art gallery space, is like acceptance by the art world. But she said, I'm not coming from that. She, she has work, it was in the context of the National Museum of Norway is reopening in June, and they are showing a series of her pieces in a, uh, a kind of multi multimedia gallery or media spanning gallery about abstract landscapes. And they're positioning it essentially, uh, her work as, a, as an abstract painting. And she was saying, no, I'm, I don't make abstract paintings, I make ceramics. And there's a whole history of abstraction that much precedes painterly abstraction that's in the kind of, cra is, is in a craft tradition. That there were people making abstract expressionist paintings on pots already in the 1800s, and actually she's drawing on that tradition and she doesn't necessarily want to be positioned in this particular, uh, the, the discourse of artistic, modern, of artistic modernism as it comes from Greenberg et al. I mean, um, also, also, like, if you're making a pot and not using it, it is exactly an abstract sculpture. I've always kind of thought. Like parts that aren't literally, you know, being used or in use, or, or, or a standard wear or, or an everyday thing. I think that is a kind of form of abstract sculpture. No, she w it's, it was abstract paint, abstract landscapes. But it was yeah, a yeah, painterly yeah. But gesture. Just talking about abstraction. Yeah. Yeah, but it was just that these two, that actually there are, there maybe there are two sets of aesthetic and technical criteria, and that actually maybe it's okay to kind of maintain those. I don't know, I'd like to kind of bring you both in on, on Aaron's point. Yeah, I think the horizontality doesn't mean that everything is the same. It's, uh, but, and uh, these specific histories, and I think act, uh, if we and, um, think also about the, um, you know, uh, queer histories, it's the, the specificity of, of each story matters. Um, but you know what what seems like the um, I mean my view is just you know the way we classify that and 
the it's just the sort of value system and the hierarchy that I'm con um, trying to deconstruct. But um, you know, yeah. I mean, I I hope we see that you know this creates more space for the specificity of each object and the genealogy that we you know sort of hybridize. Um, yeah, and I, um, the the um, one of the point of the show was actually to um, to yeah try to uh, underline the specificity specificities of that medium uh, and the multi multi uh, specificities rather than um, than trying to uh, put it uh, on the level of uh, what high art is, but more to understand why it was for so long um, uh, kind of uh, put away or down looked uh, and it was definitely not by the artists themselves um, uh, but more by some historians and you mentioned uh, Greenberg and uh, uh, the idea of retinal art exactly I think that often and the fact uh, that touch is so central exactly has so been an issue. And we wanted, and that COVID uh, kind of uh, forbid uh, it, but we wanted to actually have uh, 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 more than one pieces to be uh, touched. That was uh, impossible because of the of the sanitary craze, uh, crisis. But yeah, this idea of it's it's like textile. It's really uh, something that you can ob obviously look at, but also uh, touch, and that's. No, like usually also not bi-dimensional and so that um, aspect is uh, super important and one uh, reason why also a lot of visual artists were so um, uh, attracted to. Um, I wonder maybe Aaron if, if you just to come back to what you're doing at Troy Town because I think there's the there's the kind of artistic the residency side of it, but then there's also, there is the kind of more studio pottery element um, and thinking about the ways that you are, it, the kind of apprenticeship and the kind of the technical aspects that's also a part of the pedagogical model there. Um, with, with like the gardenware projects? And, and yeah. The, um, yeah, so I mean, we, we 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 teach. Uh, I run a youth program called Hoxton Gardenware, um, which was uh, actually one of my board members' idea, and now we just we just do it. Um, he commented one day that he couldn't buy a good flower pot on Columbia Road Flower Market, and we're quite nearby, so we now run a youth employment and training scheme, um, kind of taking a studio pottery approach to. Uh, terracotta garden pottery. It, it, it's really, really far removed from um, my main program. And the reason I started the pottery in the first place, which was to have a place to work sculpture with clay, the common link is that there's a pottery there and it's kind of all about a kind of sensibility you inject into that as a studio, which can reflect on completely different projects, which don't meet, you know. Um, but then kind of do other things like uh, the Hawks and Gardenware have just done a really big job for uh, an installation at Tate Liverpool that's opening in a few weeks for a piece of work by Ruth Ewan, um, which is a kind of physical manifestation of the um, revolutionary French calendar, kind of including with the French Institute. This is, this is good. Um, <laughs> which includes all of the plants which are ascribed to different days of the calendar when they changed it for that 10 year period. Anyway, so she needed 150 plant pots and they're just plant pots. But, but they become absorbed. Yeah, and like, process. you know, these, these, these funny connections. Um, and I ended up throwing all of them personally because it was too big for the kids to do. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 an inter it's, it's been an interesting resource for people in lots of different ways. Um, and I've been running it for like seven years now-ish. Uh, and we're trying to expand <coughs> quite considerably in the next few years. So it's sort of become, it started off as kind of a piece of work in a way, then it became a functioning pottery, and now I'm really bored of it. So I'm trying to expand it and make it a kind of bigger piece of work again, if that makes sense. Um, so we're trying to knock it down and build something bigger, basically. Yeah. 
Natsuka, maybe you could talk more about your own kind of pedagogical practice and teaching work. And also maybe to just to give a bit of a sense of the context in which, like, where you're based and whether you are also working in a pottery or yeah. that, that kind of stuff would be good to know. Yeah, um, well, actually, I have just one technical question is, can you in English say a pottery for a ceramic studio that doesn't make pots? I think it just sounds more elegant. <laughs> um, I think I used to, I mean, it's always, always been called Troy Town Art Pottery, although now I just tend to call it Troy Town. And that was a sort of, the art, the words art pottery yeah. is like Mason or Sev, that those were oh, art yeah, potteries. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. was sort of the, the yeah, oh, and those, I always saw those as more sculptural factories than, uh, obviously they made a lot of cups and saucers, so that was sort of it, um, but calling it like a ceramic studio is, is that's like a department yeah, in a university or yeah. something, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, it's just, well, it's just true. No, I find it quite liberating because in French, it's, uh, and in French ceramic culture, there's a huge divide between uh, pottery and ceramics, um, but that being said, um, my studio is in a kind of uh, more university city um, situation. So it's called Magma, uh, Master Arts and Geomaterials. And we, we started the program, well, we started the program uh, last year. Um, and it's part of uh, the French um, public art school programs. And so we have this degree um, that I coordinate and um, it's based around the practices of fusion. Um, so um, glass, uh, metals, and clay, ceramics, are the kind of main materials that we transform through fire. But as I, um, that's why I wanted to show you these earth pictures, is then we um, open up to different types of material and different processes. Um, but what I um, want to put the focus on is um, the relationship to making and the dialogue that happens between the material and uh, the maker and that kind of moment of negotiation um, to elaborate and transform both the material and, um, and us. And that's sort of my... Uh, um, pedagogical proposition for for this uh, MFA. Um, so it's less about the product uh, that is made, but more the experience that we go through um, as a class. And um, and so the acronym MAGMA is for that, for that kind of uh, melting um, uh, lava, and also refers to um, global warming. Um, so that's a program that's at uh, the Esat Tarm um, in Le Mans, which is one hour uh, west of Paris, and um, we're taking applications for uh, September 2022. <laughs> right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and me, I, um, well, I'm an artist based in south of France, but I'm originally from Japan, but uh, I've been living in France, um, well, I grew up in France. And then I went to school in America, and um, I worked on a farm after school. After art school, I started um, working on a farm, which was an art farm, but we were really wor um, making... What, what does an art farm <laughs> mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an art pottery, it's an art farm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a farm run by artists. <laughs> um, that you, and we... Did it work as a farm? We, we did okay, I, yeah. we did okay, we were, yeah. I mean, it's so much about life, you know? So if, it's, if you can feed the people on the farm and your animals are healthy, I think that's a good gauge to say that it functions okay. Um, it, like um, a, like but a, we weren't it like, like a, sorry? Was it like a commune kind of thing, or? A little bit, oh. and, um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a high production farm. It was a, a experiment. It was an experiment. So, um, and our m objective in running this farm was not to produce a lot of one cash crop um, or have like a kind of economic viability over our agricultural production, but it was more about creating a balance 
on the site and you know uh, being part of this landscape and working with with the cycles of these different activities and different crops and um, that rotate and and it's also about you know landscape uh, the these different sets so you have prairies you have forest and you have you know the sections in between and the water retention lake and all of those different sites have uh, different um, things going on. Um, and you often said that it's because you were actually farming and that you needed some containers that you yeah, that's how actually I started ceramics. Started ceramics yeah, yeah it's, it was to, so to make the, the dishes to and um, as a vehicle of our production. And it really did happen like that because, you know, there's a lot of food regulations, obviously, and we were um, selling our products um, not often, just on like uh, specific moments of high harvest, and um, and we had also uh, we were also growing pigs and making charcuterie. And um, when I looked at the food safety container catalog, it just you know they're like buckets for glaze or something. So um, that's how that's when I th you you know you put so much effort into this life and it I just didn't want it to end up in a Tupperware so that's that's pretty much how I started ceramics. <laughs> There's something very appropriately kind of uh, mingue or arts and crafts about yeah. that right the 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 kind of uh, that idea that you you know that somehow a beautiful that life is better with a beautiful teacup you know <laughs> yeah and, and that beauty the end the Minge statement is that then is that beauty is also accessible and available yeah, in everyday everyone, objects exactly. that they don't need to be like super sophisticated high end and luxury items yeah and but i'm very touched by your practice because you know i i mean the it's rare the porosity between uh functional wear pottery the sort of Eastern Minge tradition, and also a kind of personal, you know, material relationship to the, to making and transforming these shapes. So, and m me, I think I benefit from my um, sort of um, hybrid uh, mm -hmm. history and um, Eastern uh, culture where these divides um, hap they happen, but elsewhere. So then, you know, you can adapt. <laughs> I know um, we, were, we, were, we started about 15 minutes late, so we are overrunning a bit, but I wonder if there are questions from the floor at this moment. Uh, so the dysfunctional, you mean? It says right. Yeah. So it relates actually to what um, Natsuko also said. Um, it's this idea of this hierarchy that was uh, made uh, mainly in the West uh, and uh, especially uh, by um, uh, art historian and and uh, and uh, museum uh, curators that actually state that. Uh, functional um, piece, uh, a vessel and a, and a utilitarian um, a piece cannot be uh, an artwork. It's like this functionality that actually prevents uh, uh, an object of being an art object. And it's a very constructed, um, of course, idea. And um, so I thought of, um, started to think maybe if sculpture is sort of dysfunctional in a way, you know, just, just re uh, invert the, the this idea of uh, of uh, what's functional and dysfunctional and non-functional. And that was one of the of the in the in the parcours, uh, which started with. Uh, so techniques at first, and then the uses, and within the uses, we had uh, 
uh, functional pieces, but some of them made by artists. So the kind of proof that actually they don't, uh, you know, think and uh, and uh, refer to those classifications, but then also functional, uh, dysfunctional, sorry, and sculptural um, pieces that had only an allusion uh, to uh, uh, former function or another function. Yeah, I think that qu the kind of question of the that the question of function is a bit of an illusion in any case, you know, I think in terms of when you think about uh, th that point that you made, Aaron, exactly about an, a, a vessel that's not in use is an abstract sculpture, I think is kind of exactly, you sort of hit the nail on the head there somehow. Yeah, and you can, you can pretty much split potters along that line of like ones who are like, why are my pots selling for £10,000 each? This, you're supposed to use this every day. I'm talking about old pot, old people. But, or people that have always done it in this slightly, <sighs> this is a kind of elevated vessel kind of thing, or like the vessel in the expanded field or bullshit like that, you know, like there's, there's this, that's the divide, I think. But also, <coughs> I think uh, the museum uh, artification process that actually, uh, it's very hard in a, in a museum to actually uh, have the connection with a former use, uh, even if you're showing and exhibiting a, mm. a, a former functional object, it becomes a sculpture. So in the show, there was actually this idea of uh, artified um, uh, object, and that as an effect of museum, uh, and, uh, and the idea of countering these white cube, um, you know, um, uh, dimension was also a way to um, to sort of put uh, back uh, some domesticity uh, and and the, the allusion to 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 uses <coughs> that are different from being abstracted in those museum uh, or artistic. Uh, when I was space. working at the Leech Pottery, the production potters there would really often break into the museum, not break in, but they would go into the museum section. And they would start taking out things which were two, three thousand years old to see how they poured. And they had no interest in, in that kind of hageology of, of the objects. They, they wanted to see how, the, how, how they worked. Yeah. Well, they wanted to see if the teapot that they threw that, that morning was the same as this Iraqi vessel from, from two thousand years ago. You know. there's, a, it, there's like a purity of, of, and drive there <laughs> that's really funny. I think it's interesting to be having this conversation um, here in South Kensington, right next to the V&A, which I was thinking when you were dis discussing the, that, the vitrine that you restaged, because obviously the V&A was founded as a kind of technical museum. It was craft examples that were, you know, the apprentices, Victorian apprentices would go to to observe, to understand how these things were made and how they functioned. Um, and I suppose... It is not in any sense a non-hierarchical institution. It, its whole kind of layout coordinates a particular kind of, of movement. But it, it's interesting that they introduced, they have you know, the ceramics residency there, which is in the middle also of the it's galleries. Like this horrible fishbowl. Yeah. I refuse to do it. Like, it's just... I always think to the artists, just, they, just, they, they, they must just do it at night, don't you think? Do you get a key? Yeah, I think, I think access is not that late into the evening, but people put, like, newspaper over the walls, things like that. It's fucking weird. It's, yeah. <laughs> but it, I guess it was the, the kind of idea that you would be in, the pro in proximity to these, uh, these objects, and though I'm sure they're not actually allowing people to see how the Ming vases poor P possibly i don't Th know that's the point of that it well yeah. i i thought so too yeah. you should do it so we, we find out more <laughs> we get the inside track uh, why people are interested <laughs> um well there is a whole i mean we, we're i will wrap up now but there is a ho also a whole kind of coming out of the, I think the studio itself has been a limiting factor in the way that ceramics, the, the distinction, Natsuko, that you pointed to between the 
um, the pottery and ceramic studio. I think that the pot, the kind of the the studio an has anchored ceramics in a particular kind of craft context, and there was there have been at various moments uh, from the kind of fifties onwards these attempts to break out of the studio, like ceramics in the expanded field, for kind of want of of a better word. Um, so it is quite it, it is kind of interesting that the the studio is the re the recentering actually of the studio in for instance in your show and in, in the residency here and um, we've probably got time for one more question from the floor yes, I've got one more question. yeah <laughs> So uh, uh, I guess it means to uh, uh, traverse, so it, um, uh, go through. So I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of tra uh, translation issues, and then also those texts. You know, uh, we count those words, so it, it can become quite dense. But uh, as I was saying, you know, I went to art school, but I worked in farming, and. Um, yeah, uh, for a moment in art schools, at least m when I was going to art school, ceramics was not part of arts education, and I'm working to in my school to make it part of uh, how we teach and how um, we practice art. Um, and yeah, I that's an ambition that I have in, in my life and practice is to um, not be framed in one discipline, but be able to go through and navigate different ones. I think that's probably a quite a nice place on which to wrap up. Thank you, Anne, Natsuko, and Aaron for your, for your thoughts. Thank you all for your attention and to the French Institute for hosting us. Um, I have enjoyed it very much. And I hope we can continue the conversation in other places and other times. Thanks.